I was feeling so good for the first time in a long time and I did a ton of traveling and kind of like started really trying to fire on all cylinders again and then I think I just got middle-aged real fast. <laughs> About the time I, like maybe from 40 to 45, I feel like I was just like kicking ass. I was like feeling great and doing great and running around and and getting a lot of stuff done. And, and then as soon as it was just like, it was like clockwork. As soon as 45 hit, it was just like somebody put me in low gear and I just all the things that happen to people you know my my hair has been falling out for a while but it really started to fall out and my eyes went bad and my knees and back started hurting and I started getting like a little bit of like a waddly thing under my chin and all that stuff you know it kind of depends but physically I'm doing pretty good I feel like I, I was kind of half joking to people a couple of weeks ago because I had my first like really bad OCD attack in like 10 years. And uh, pretty much I and I kind of think this is true. I kind of think just like 2020 caught up with me, <laughs> you know, like it was just like the tension, worry, anxiety, depression levels reached a certain point where it's just like, OK, you're going to lose your mind for about a week and then. It wasn't as bad as it used to be, but it was a little bit unnerving because I've, I've had a pretty good uh, last 10 years or so with dealing with it. How does a OCD attack manifest itself? Well, it, it kind of depends. And, <clears throat> you know, people with OCD, there's a lot of different ways it can manifest. There's a lot of different ways the illness can like appear in your life. And so certain people have certain triggers or whatever, you know, like, for like for me I was a big contamination freak like I was always worried that something was going to be contaminated and I was going to touch it and not know it and get sick so I was like a I was an OCD person who washed their hands all the time but like I'm not an OCD person who's like a neat freak like a lot of OCD people like oh there's like a hair on the floor I have to pick it up you know like to me th that doesn't bother me at all I've lived in like chaos and stuff most of my life um so I mean in this case and one of the I mean one of the worst parts of the, about the OCD was when it would affect my creativity and my comics and uh, so in this case it was um I had the whole issue of King Cat done I had it like laid out for the printer and I was doing my like last just kind of glance through the pages, make sure, make sure everything looks right, everything's in the right order. And I just noticed this little anomaly that most people would not even notice that was just, I'm not even going into the details, but it was just, it was almost like a compositional thing with which the I, I can be real particular with, um, you know, left facing pages, right facing pages, page turns and stuff like that they you know depending on what you're doing in your in the the comic you're working on those kind of layout decisions can make a real big impact on the comic on the way it reads and feels and stuff I had this ended up with a left facing page and a right facing page that just looked really odd together and sometimes I don't worry about that stuff but I had been going on very little sleep and super stressed in 2020 and all that stuff. So this time it really bothered me. So I went in to do some, like I fixed it just by adding some extra lines and stuff like that. But my, my OCD and it's kind of a cartoonist thing, but like when I go back and fix stuff or change stuff, I get really obsessed that I don't want the reader to be able to like, I don't want the reader to be able to be like, oh, he drew this comic. And then like four months later, he went back in and drew this section of it or redrew it or whatever. Like, so I want to, it to be seamless, any kind of editing. And um, so I became obsessed that like, oh, this new thing that I drew to fix the composition of this page looks weird or like it's going to stick out or, I, you know, it's OCD. So it doesn't necessarily, it's not even that rational. But it got down to where like I was measuring pixels 
in Photoshop and like, well, that line's 28 pixels wide and this line's 28 pixels wide, so they must look the same. And I did that. It wasn't super bad, maybe like four or five days where all I did was think about how many pixels were in this line that I drew. And, uh, and then I kind of just got mad and said, okay, it's time for this thing to go to the printer. Looking at these collections, it's a, it's a nice opportunity to, to see how your art has evolved over the years. And you know, one, one of the most obvious pieces of that is the push you've made towards minimalism. Does that play a role here? Obviously, the more minimal your artwork gets, the clearer it is when something is out of place. Uh, oh, yeah. So in terms, I mean, that's something that I've always pointed out to people when I do workshops or whatever, or when I'm just defending myself <laughs> from critics. But, you know, when you draw a page of comics that consists of three lines, they ha they absolutely have to be the right three lines, right? Like it's very noticeable. And one of the great things about digital editing, and also one of the terrible things for a person with OCD is that I mean, I can manipulate things minutely. And, um, and the honest truth is that, you know, if you have a certain line and you nudge it, I don't know, one sixty fourth of, of an inch or something, it makes a, it makes an impact on, um, on the way the drawing reads or feels in many cases. Sometimes it's not as, as precise or as, you know, it doesn't have to be as fine tuned, but it does make a difference. And so one of the tricky things with making art with OCD is that there's kind of, I mean, a, a lot of art making is intuition, right? And so it's just kind of like, you can't really put it into words what you're trying to do, but you kind of know it when you see it and you know it, and you also know it when you don't see it. Right. And, and it's like something's bugging me with this drawing and what is it and how do I improve the drawing? And so some of it, a, a lot of it is intuition, which is not a rational thing. And then there, there's a line where OCD can kind of feel like that, too. Like, oh, there's something wrong here. You know, there's something odd. What is it and how do I mess things around to improve it. So that's a lot of what I do in my art compositionally and things like that. And so it becomes kind of a tricky line to walk when you have OCD, where you're kind of like, is this my like creative intuition telling me that I need to work on this some more? Or is it just some kind of brain loop? And there's certain tricks that I've learned to be able to identify them. But sometimes you go through like a a good amount of suffering before you figure it out. So in this case, uh, I was obsessed about, basically I drew an extra panel box on this page and I was obsessed with like, oh, does it look bad? Does it stand out? Does it look like I made a mistake and tried to fix it, all these crazy things. And I kind of finally worked on it for a couple of days and got it to the point where it's just like, no, you know what, this is fine. And as I was going over, looking over the page, I went back in and just did a super fine tuning on a couple words. So like, I'll look at my, the words of a text, the text in a box, I'll blow it up real big and I'll like clean little scratchy lines that come off the end or whatever, sometimes if it's distracting. So I went back in, cleaned up a couple little sections of text. And then as soon as I did that, I became obsessed that oh, now I messed up these words. And when people read these words, it's going to like throw them off and it's, it's not going to read correctly. And it, when I became obsessed about the text, the, the box that I had worried about for four days instantly was meaningless. And that's a, that's, that's a trick for me that I learned from having OCD for so long was like, the OCD is just this loop haywire thing in your brain that needs something to focus on. And once it loses its focus on something, it'll jump to another thing. And then you know, oh, so I wasn't even worried about that box and I'm not really worried about this text because tomorrow I'll be worried about something else and this won't seem painful to me anymore. 
And so when something like that happens, then it's just like, oh, okay, well, this is definitely OCD. This is not any kind of like creative aesthetic decision-making process going on. This is just a, a, a loop in your brain that won't shut off. So, but anyhow, you know, knock on wood, it hasn't been, it's really been pretty mild the last 10 years or so. This was, this was the worst little bout of it that I had in, in a long time. You know, it's one thing to be dealing with this in the editing process, but role does it play early on? I mean, do, do you find that being a perfectionist to that degree and, and being that focused on minutia can be a form of paralysis when it comes to sort of sitting down with a blank page and creating yeah, for, I know for some people, it might be very well might be for me, it doesn't really take that form so much. It's it's mostly I have a hard time finishing things. You know, that seems to be my, my big, uh, the thing that brings up the anxiety for me is is finishing something. Um, and, you know, it's weird, because I'm kind of a perfectionist, but I'm also kind of sloppy, you know, and kind of lazy. I mean, if you look at my comics, I think there's a little precision there, but they're definitely not what you'd call perfect comics, I don't think. Uh, you know, I'm not using like a, uh, what are those French curve or whatever to make my lines real smooth and stuff. And and I like the little bit of grittiness and, and the little anomalies that come from just making a mark with your hand. If you look at my early comics, obviously they were completely unrestrained, really loose, uh, sloppy to the point of illegibility. And um, I mean, there's a certain part of comics making to me that is just that thrill of making that mark on paper, you know? So um, like I said, sometimes I get hung up on this craziness and, and sometimes I'll I mean, I, a lot of the decision-making I do is leaving mistakes in because they just look better. or Somehow they work in a way that, that I don't want to lose by trying to, to tweak something or adjust something. So I, I uh, you know, I, I intentionally leave a lot, a lot of rough spots in my comics. The OCD doesn't make sense. So, but um, I, I usually don't have a problem like putting stuff down on paper. It's, it's, it, the problem comes when I'm trying to get it out into the world and a lot of anxiety can come up around that. When you sit down to work on a specific page, is it fully formed in your brain? Do you know pretty well what the layout is going to look like? Yes. And I mean, most of it is just kind of intuitive and I, um, but definitely what uh, the way I describe my drawing is that I'm just, I, I, I'm trying to put something down that I see in my head. I'm trying to make it real. I'm trying to put it in some kind of tangible form that then I can share with other people. And so, you know, when you mentioned like the minimalist thing, I think I always was kind of a minimalist. And, but at times for sure, and over time, what I see in my head is just plainer. It gets plainer and plainer and simpler and simpler and kind of uh, distilled down more and more. Part of the process of working on it is actually removing elements from it. That's a huge part for me is, is whittling stuff down. And a lot of times I'll make what I think is a really beautiful drawing, but if there's too much going on in it, it's too busy, which, which can work in certain cases. Um, but in some cases it's just not, it's, it's a beautiful drawing, but for the comic that it's going to go into in the place it's going to go into, it's just not right. And it's, it's always a little bit painful to erase all those lines uh, because nobody's ever going to see them. Yes. A, a huge part for me is just uh, whittling stuff down. Like when I have a new idea for a story, oftentimes I will, um, I'll do what I call memory pages. So if I'll have like, Oh, remember the, guy who used to walk around the neighborhood when I was a kid who sharpened knives you know he had like a little cart a hand cart with a bell and people would bring their knives and scissors out and he'd sharpen them on the sidewalk I'll take my notebook and I'll just start writing everything that I can re recall about this this notion and it'll take me all kinds of places. It'll take me all the way to like the way the sidewalk smelled on the side of our house in July or whatever and I will um, just 
fill up pages at page after page after page. And, um, and what I usually then I go back into those, those memory pages and you can, I can pull out two or three sentences out of that. And that can be a whole story in itself. And so, you know, I'll, I can maybe use some of the stuff I wrote in later in a different context. I just throw all that stuff down on paper and then kind of wrestle with it a little bit to see where, where, what are the parts that I want to take further. But generally speaking, I do kind of see the page in my head before I draw it, or, or it's more of a process of just starting at the top and working my way through a page and adjusting where I'm going, getting a sense of where the story is going. Um, I don't really do thumbnails or things like that, like a lot of cartoonists do, but there will, the time that I'll do thumbnails is when I have a certain story and it needs to fit a certain page count. Like if I've got three pages left in the issue and I've got a story that I want to do, how do I make that story three pages? And so I will, that's when I will actually sit down and draw little boxes and work out beforehand, okay, this is going to be a six panel grid page. This one's going to have a horizontal panel at the top and three vertical panels in the middle and then a big panel at the bottom and, and things like that. Just again, I'm, I'm lazy, so I, I hate redrawing things. I like to draw things one time and not have to fuss with them too much. And so when I have a situation like that where I have a story that needs to fit a specific amount of space, then I'll, I'll work a little bit harder getting things figured out in that way before I put pencil to paper. At what point does an idea like that pop into your head? You know, I suspect that's the kind of thing that you don't think about every day, but at some point this memory from the past just kind of pops in. Yeah. I, and I mean, it's just, it's one of those muse type unexplainable things that when you're an artist of any kind, I think you have those moments of intuition or some kind of flash where something that you haven't thought of in 30 years will suddenly become illuminated to you or just pop into your head with the benefit of, you know, all the perspective you have now. So, you know, one of my working processes is that I, I have big stacks of notebooks that I just fill. A lot of it is work when I'm trying to work out a story or edit a story down or lists like busy work. One thing that's useful by having all that stuff on paper is that when I'm stuck for an idea, I can, use, I can often turn to those notebooks and I'll just flip through them and look for stuff that you know, five years ago, I tried to work out some story and it just went, didn't go anywhere. It just got stuck or there was some kind of problem with it that um, I couldn't solve at the time. And then looking at it with another five years of life and just maybe a little bit different shifted perspective, all of a sudden that story that was so difficult to work on that I just kind of abandoned, suddenly it kind of blossoms as I'm going through, I'm like, okay, I know how to do this now, you know? And so that story will make its way out of that old notebook into the new King Cat. You can work and work, but I always was a person who tried to do what came naturally. And so, you know, if I'm working on a story and it just kind of is fizzling or I'll just, I'll just put it off to the side and, and eventually get back to it and a lot of times you have that experience that I described where all of a sudden everything makes sense. You know, all the frustration and, and sticking points <clears throat> that were dragging the story down before there's some solution that's instantly clear and the whole thing just kind of pours out. Does the, the fizzling generally happen at a specific point? You know, is, is this before you actually put ink on paper? Yeah. I, and again, I'm going to keep saying it, I guess, because that's the theme for tonight. I, I, I'm lazy when it comes to comics. By the time I start drawing a comic, I pretty much know exactly what I want to do. I, I work all that stuff out in the pages of these notebooks. And for me, primarily, that process is mostly a writing process. I will 
like my notebook isn't really filled with sketches at all. It's filled with what are almost kind of like scripts, you know? So like I'll have a story written out in text. I'll usually go in with a pencil or something and break that text up into what will eventually be individual panels of a comic. And I'll kind of break down expositional things and break down uh, dialogue Occasionally I'll put like a little funny drawing in the corner or something where I have like some kind of facial expression that I want to capture and, and I'll note it in there. But mostly what my notebooks are, is just, it's all just writing. And I will go back and then basically go through that story multiple times, refining it changing words around, cutting out a lot, like I mentioned before, rearranging things until I get, it gets, it kind of has this natural conversational flow to it. And it's usually at that point, after a lot of work that um, I will actually start drawing. So, you know, nowadays I, I get about, if, if I work on a new issue for a year, probably, nine months of that year is just spent writing and editing. And then typically once I start drawing, it goes pretty fast. Um, if, if I have to like really, if I end up struggling with a drawing, it usually becomes a real struggle. Like if I have to, if I don't get the drawing right the first time, sometimes it will take a dozen attempts to get where I want it to be. But usually I just, usually once I do the drawing, it's very quick. And I, in a way I feel like when I say, I can see the page before I draw it, it's because I've thought about the page for so long before I actually draw it. You know, by the time I actually pick up a pencil and, and put it on some board and start drawing the, the, the panels and stuff, it's kind of, just stated in my brain long enough that it just spills out. Do you feel that you've actually gotten slower and more methodical as you've continued to do this? Yeah, for sure. In that, I mean, there's a couple of, I mean, I'm just slower. Everything I do is a lot slower than it used to be nowadays compared to even 10 or 15 years ago. So there's just that physical aspect of it too. I don't have this, this actual stamina to like sit and draw all night like I used to. And then also I think I've become, a, I, I used to, and, and this was intentional really in the early days, just be a lot more spontaneous. So I would just like get an idea, I'd throw it down on paper. I wouldn't look back. I just put it in the done pile, stack them up, go print them. By the time the I would, had printed the previous issue, I was already halfway through the new one, you know. And so, um, as time has gone on, I've become a lot more selective about the stories that I do and and how I approach them. And um, so that just naturally takes time, and it it also like cuts a lot of a lot out. So maybe of the ten stories I work am working on at any given time, maybe two of them will make it to the new issue versus all 10 of them, which is what it would have been, you know, 25 years ago or 20 years ago. I'm just a lot more selective and then a lot more, it is a little bit more painstaking. And I just have a lot more going on too in my life running and uh, I'm, I'm busier and have less energy. <laughs> so it, it, things go slow. Um, so, but yes, definitely. As somebody who is a, you know, a perfectionist to some degree and don't suffer from OCD when it comes to your, your own work. When these reissues come out from Drawn and Quarterly, is it, is it hard for you to go back and look at the early work? Usually once there's a little bit of a remove for me from it, then I stop worrying about the stuff. Then it's kind of like, well, this is what it is. It's out in the world and this is the form it, it took. You know, when I was... There are very there are very minor little edits that I I did putting the book collections together. So there there might be a there's a few little things that are different than what where they were in the zines. Either something that really bothered me, like really bothered me. There's like I definitely wanna wanna have a second shot at that, or just 
you know, kind of a very mild editing process where some stuff I just don't, didn't hold up or over time or whatever. And I'll, I'll kind of excise it, you know, to a certain extent, I kind of accept when I say like, I, I try to let what comes out, come out naturally to, in order to do that, I have to have a certain acceptance of uh, a, or a certain willingness to let my not super great moments out in public, you know, and I don't, I, I, I don't worry about it too much. By the time somebody's collecting the material in a book, it, it's so far behind me that it doesn't bug me anymore. I'm just happy to see the stuff out there. And I've kind of made my peace with the errors or imperfections at that point. And these new books with D&Q, they're pretty much straight reprints. They're, they're formatted a little bit differently, just physically. I think the only actual editing I did in them was in the back of a perfect example. There was kind of a funny tongue in cheek mini biography. And so I updated that to cover the last 15 years since the first edition or whenever it was. But otherwise they're just straight reprints of, of the books. And again, as, as time goes on too, and I become more kind of careful and particular about what I put in King Cat and what I leave out, there's not too much fussiness when it comes to doing the collections. Like From Lone Mountain, the most recent one, I want to say it's pretty much pretty straightforward just collection. I don't think there was much work that went into like tidying things up or any edits or fix its or anything like that. But like the first one, King Cat Classics was, you know, I, I, I basically had a nervous breakdown over that book because it was just so much work. And I was so, I was so um, just worried about every little detail of it because there, there was so much that went into that. But, uh, you know, that's one of the benefits, I guess, of spending the extra time now on the King Cats is when it comes time to collect the stuff, all that, all that work has pretty much been done. And I, I pretty much feel, feel good about it. As your stuff has become more studious and more deliberate, uh, do you think that's impacted the truthfulness and, and, and personalness of the work itself? Uh, no, I don't think so. In my case, almost the, the way that that has impacted it, it I, I, and I'm kind of thinking out loud here, so I may not agree with this tomorrow, but I think it's a more formal kind of thing. Like I think the, the actual content of King Cat has remained pretty similar through all these years. What has changed is kind of the aesthetics of it a little bit, like the, ex, the, the outside shell in a way, in a way, maybe you could even say that it's it's more truthful because there was a lot of stuff that I would throw in those old King Cat. You know, when I was 20 years old, you know, when you're in your 20s or something, you I, I didn't have a lot of self-esteem, but I but I also thought like I, I had very firm opinions about a lot of things and I felt like uh, I like to speak my mind about them and I wasn't afraid to like rattle people and you know honestly probably a lot of that stuff maybe it you could say it was truthful at the time but there wasn't that kind of stuff doesn't have a more inherent truth to it um, it's more just being obnoxious for the sake of being obnoxious or trying to push people's buttons and things like that. Um, I don't know. I'm kind of, it's more punk. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's punk in the sense of up years old man, look at me, I've got my own comic book, you know, or whatever. Whereas, and some of that, I think at least for me probably was a little bit false um, or at least maybe something that uh, very quickly didn't feel as, as it didn't feel right to me anymore. You don't really, for most intents and purposes, don't really know who you are when you're in your twenties. You're still tr figuring yes. that out. Yes, exactly. And you're, you figure it out very loudly. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's that's in one sentence, you just uh, said everything I was just trying to say for the past five minutes. How important is this idea of, of truth? You know, when, when you're putting 
a personal story down on paper, how important is it that it's, it adheres to your perception of reality as it happened? I would say that it's pretty important for me. I would say that in the past, I had a kind of almost journalistic kind of uh, drive. Like I, I wanted things to be true with air quotes, right? I, if, if, if it took, you know, if it was 14 miles to the show and I wrote it was 10 miles to the show, I, I wouldn't let that go. Like I, and I'd bug people all the time and I'd like research all kinds of stuff. I still do a lot of research for comics, strangely, but the point where that changed for me was when I was doing the story that ended up being collected as perfect example. And um, so that was the first time that I was trying to do something, you know, larger and more complicated than I had tried to do in the past. I think the pre, I, I did an 18 page story, which is the um, Belmont Harbor story, which was, came out a few issues before uh, the perfect example storyline. And that was like mind blowing. Cause I mean, I think my previous longest story had been like six pages or something and so um when i realized i would need a little bit of a different approach to get this done right with such a complicated and kind of longer story and one of the things that i did was i i most i'm mostly still friends with all the people who like were in my life at that time when i was a teenager and so i had the benefit of being able to go back and just call them up and say and ask them. And I kind of just interviewed them about when I was doing that, working on that book. And one of the things that I realized almost immediately was that every one of these different people who are like in the same room at the same time for the same event happening had totally different perspectives on it. And, and, it, and over the course of time had kind of developed their own ideas about what happened based on their like personal focus. And so, you know, that's a really basic understanding or a basic thing to realize, but it really drove home for me that I, I'm just drawing, I'm just drawing my truth when I do a story for King Cat. And I do take into consideration other people's points of views and things like that. But ultimately what I'm writing about is this one guy's perspective on something that happened through these eyes that nobody else is seeing things quite the same way. And it really kind of liberated me from that feeling of having to have some kind of journalistic truth. And, um, you know, I want the stories to be true, but in a sense, what I'm looking for is for the story to be true to itself versus true to some kind of objective reality. But you're not heightening elements in order to make them a more interesting story. Right. I'm not doing that kind of stuff, but I am making creative decisions about what goes in, what goes out, and what's emphasized and what isn't. And um, all those things, you know, are subjective. That was a huge turning point for me because it allowed me in a way to even though I'm writing autobiographical comics, it allowed me to maybe get a little more literary with them rather than journalistic. I started to look at the stories a little bit different at, at that point. There's a certain amount of distance built in that comes with the editing process that you described earlier, but do you get a sense that there needs to be time between you and the events that you're writing about in order to be able to contextualize them properly? I don't know that I would say contextualize them properly, except that, you know, and that's what I guess I was saying earlier is like the early comics, I would go out into the world, have some experience. I'd come home that night and draw a comic about it immediately. Right. And so there wasn't any room for any kind of time to, to, to elapse or, or perspective to be gained. It was a very immediate perspective. It was action and reaction. And so, you know, every once in a while, I'll be able to pull it off still where 
I say something stupid to my dog and, and it's like, that would be a great comic. And I'll go upstairs and that night I'll have a new comic about something that happened that was really immediate. And, and it just kind of came out really immediately. Um, but again, um, it's just, it's, it's kind of the nature of just slowing down and, and just as my life has changed, that has changed. So, um, as you know, I don't often, I just don't often have the time to even do that. So I, I end up having like a lot of little poems or little ideas for stories on the back of receipts and stuff that I put on my pocket. I just throw it on my drawing table. And then when I sit down three weeks later, I don't even remember. And I look, what's this? Oh yeah. Okay. And then I'll, I'll draw it. But I, I don't think it's necessary. I guess it depends what you're trying to do with your comics. When I started yeah. out, I was specifically trying, I, I wanted it to be super immediate. I wanted it to be that, I wanted to have that rawness and that um, spontaneity to it. And I was young, so I didn't really have that much time. You know, I'm 30 years older now. So I have, I just by the nature of having slogged across this planet for an extra 30 years, you, you, it, it's, you've got to develop some extra perspective on things and it becomes, it becomes useful. It's another tool you have as an artist. It's just, I, I've changed a lot over those years and the way I go about it changes with the times, I guess. I, I guess we should distinguish though a story about you know you saying something stupid to your dog and the hospital suite that's kind of what i'm wondering when it when it comes to framing and time and and context whether distance is required for these really kind of these big life-changing stories for that one for sure i mean because one of the tricky you know i i worked on that story for years and years and I mean, I, when I got, for instance, the first time I went in the hospital, I got out, I immediately sat down with one of these notebooks and wrote everything out, right? I, I like had a calendar and I wrote the dates of everything. Like this was the date I had the test. This was the day I was admitted. This was the day I was discharged. This was the day the doctor told me this. Um, because I knew eventually this would probably be a comic. Whenever that happened, I, I I made I might benefit from having some of this, some of these notes and and this this kind of uh, source material. And so for me with that one, which is kind of funny because a lot of my stories don't really have beginnings or endings. They just kind of like drop into into this little situation and then kind of lift out of them. But with the hospital suite one, one of the problems that I had while I worked on it which, you know, I worked in fits and starts on it for years and years, was that I just didn't know how it ended. You know, I didn't know how the actual, I, the, the, the process that I was writing about, I was still in the midst of every day. And even this was years and years later, right? Like I was still, I was still suffering the, ling- the lingering fallout of that surgery. I was, I was, I was still suffering the development of this obsessive compulsive disorder that came out of that health crisis. You know, I was still ill. I was still sick Um, in ways, in some ways I was sicker than I was when I walked into the hospital the first time. And so, you know, maybe for a little one or two page poetic kind of comic about some experience or mood or feeling you have, it, you can, you know, for, for, yeah, for this kind of story, I, I needed to know how it ended. You know, I, I needed to have some way of, of demarcating, how do I end this book? And that took a long time. And it took just, it took me healing up physically. And it took up me healing up a lot emotionally and mentally, as far as my anxiety and OCD and stuff until it was just finally time to be able to do it. So the, yeah, that, that one I could not have done. I could have done like diary comics, you know, here's what happened today in the hospital. And that would have been totally valid and they might've been actually pretty good comics, but the way it worked out, it, 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 it required 
I don't know, however many years that was, 15 years or something, um, in order to process it and be able to put it on paper. I mean, a similar thing happened with Perfect Example where that, that story happened, basically takes place over the summer of 1986. And the first time I sat down to try to try to memorialize it in some kind of creative way was the fall of 1986. You know, it was a couple months after it all happened. I sat down and I knew it was some kind of important point in my life or turning point in my life that I wanted to document in, in my art somehow. I mean, I wasn't even really drawing comics that much back then. I was mostly doing painting and writing and stuff like that. But um, I mean, the perfect example was a, a story that I, I would work on for four or five or six months and then abandon it and then come back to it five years later and then work on it a little bit more and abandon it and come back two years later and pick that up. And, and it, in a way, I think it was that um, the Belmont Harbor story where I pulled off an 18 page story that kind of had a real arc to it and built and had kind of a, a mystery to it that I liked where I felt like, you know what, I think I've learned enough about making comics that I maybe could tackle that that story finally and that's kind of what happened with that so you know it was I tried to do it for many many years but I just wasn't there yet either as a person or as an artist use the word processing and and I think that that's the word that I was kind of circling around a little bit and it's something that I'm thinking about a lot as it pertains to my own writing in the current moment you know I had somebody say hey I'd love to read something you wrote about, you know, the health struggles that you're going through while all this other stuff is going on. And I, processing is exactly the right word. You know, I feel like if I'm going to write a piece about it, that there has to be some sort of, for me, a larger like takeaway or moral or lesson or, or something like that. Are, are these, are those considerations that go into your own work? Do you feel like you need to sort of like have this lesson learned from the event that you impart on the piece and the reader? Well, sometimes, I mean, I actually have a comic. I, I, it's, I'm pulling this out of the deep recesses of my brain, but there's a comic that I drew when I lived in Elgin called Just Possum. So that must have been in Map of My Heart, where I kind of, I, I go out at lunch at, from my, you know, health food store job, and I'm walking around in this empty lot behind the store and there's this possum rustling around in the weeds and I part of the story is me going through that process of like I, I kind of want to draw a comic about this possum but there's no there's definitely no point to this story right can I just do a story about walking out in this field at lunch and seeing a possum licking a tin can or whatever the heck it was doing so that was the story was was me wondering is this a valid is this a valid enough thing to document and i think i say that i think that's what it says at the end like no no moral no message just possum <laughs> and that's one thing too that as i've gotten older i've become more um cognizant of is that i do have an audience like people are going to read this right and and i Especially, I feel like in this day and age when we're bombarded by stimulus, stimulation, and most of it is garbage, you know, right? I mean, most of it is, most of it is trash. And so I have become a little bit more aware of, I'll give myself some leeway and some flexibility, but I really do want to provide something that's going to have some meaning to somebody that's going to provide something some kind of human thing that goes beyond mere stimulation or entertainment or time killing or whatever it is that we spend so much of our lives immersed in nowadays but i also over time have come to see that as as the writer the creator you don't you don't usually you don't often have a, a good grasp on you know what is the meaning of this story you know um 
because the reader's going to take it and run with it. And they're going to find all kinds of stuff that you never intended or never even considered. And so I have kind of grown to trust that part of the process for me as well, too. Like, sometimes there's a story in King Cat where just like, I don't really know what this is all about. I don't really know if there is any kind of point to this or larger meaning or it just kind of came out and a lot of times those stories that I really like hem and haw about and I'm just like oh forget it just put it in there anyway almost always somebody will write to me or say something you know and say oh yeah that story about uh that tin can the possum was licking I loved that story it made me think about this one time where whatever and they'll tell me this whole thing and it's funny how that almost always happens like the the story that I had the most qualms about is the story that somebody picks out and imbues with meaning to the point that they feel it's necessary to contact me and tell me about it. And so I just kind of trust sometimes that, you know, maybe maybe I don't know what the bigger picture is in this particular piece of creation, but maybe there's somebody out there that needs this right now. And I, you know, I don't want to get too esoteric about things, but I I do believe that in a way that's the way the universe works. I want to get a little bit esoteric on it. What's the Zen Buddhist approach to a story about a possum licking a can? You know, is, is it that, that there's value in just telling that story or is it that 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 story should impart some specific meaning? Well, I think, if you really want to get Zen Buddhist about it, it probably could be both of those or, or neither of them. I mean, one of the things that really drew me to Zen when I found it was this idea that there's a transcendent value in the everyday, that there's a power and beauty that underlies all of our experience. And that Every once in a while, maybe fleetingly, we can catch a glimpse of that. And it provides a kind of ground for our experience. And there's a certain way of looking at the world where even the most meaningless experience or sight or feeling or thought transcends that meaninglessness. And there, uh, Joseph Campbell I, I don't know exactly what it was, but it's, it's something like he, he, he was talking, I think this is from Power of Myth where he's talking to, uh, what's his name? And he says, and they're talking about meaning and he says something like, what is the meaning of a rock? You know, what is the meaning of a flower? There's, is there any meaning there? Not really, but it serves a purpose in this universe. So I would say that to me, I think, Seeing the world through that kind of lens was something that came very naturally to me and was something that I was kind of bumbling through in my life. And that when I found Zen, it it was kind of a it was kind of like a getting a pat on the back or something, saying like, actually, actually there other people have seen things this way. And we've been we've been wondering about the same stuff for a long time. And here's this vast literature and experience and stuff where we've tried to approach these questions. And, um, but so, you know, the things, like I say, the things that, uh, uh, the things that attracted me to it were that kind of faith in the meaning of meaninglessness and an appreciation for the present moment, no matter what it is, you know, whether you're screaming in agony in a hospital bed, or you're like sitting in a field of daffodils on a sunny day. There's a way to learn to appreciate that experience on a deeper level that I think enriches us as humans. 
And that's really what I think I was trying to do with King Cat all along. I was trying to say, look at this thing. We're alive. This, some shit happens. Something beautiful happens. Mostly nothing happens. And yet there's a kind of power and certainly a mystery to this existence. I mean, that's been my motivating, trying to, trying to chase after that mystery has been the thing that's motivated me since I, my earliest memory, you know, since I was three or four years old or whenever that, whenever it was. And so with my art, I was just drawn to this I was drawn to creativity and art as a way of trying to explore that mystery. I always say uh, rock and roll saved my life, but, but Buddhism gave it meaning. It put into uh, some kind of tangible form, this intangible feeling that I'd followed my whole life. So is part of your job as a cartoonist, as a, a chronicler to capture the nothingness between the things as well? I mean, is, is that part of the picture that you're trying to paint are obviously the kind of the big moments, the, the health struggles that happened to you, but is part of what, you, are, are you actively trying to sort of put the, the nothingness in the book as well? 100%, yes, absolutely. Because like I said, most, most of our lives are nothing. Most of our lives are like eating a bowl of granola. Most of our lives are putting on our shoe or taking a crap every morning, you know? And most of our life is so, you know, you, the word would be mundane. It becomes easy to forget about it. it. Becomes easy to ignore it or be caught up outside of that experience, right? And that's, I mean, that's what meditation is. Meditation is, meditation is your mind wandering. That's what it naturally does. Meditation is taking that mind and saying, sit down again, come back here, you know, over and over and over again. And even if I couldn't articulate it in, in kind of Buddhist terms, but when I used to get a, I'd get a kick in my comics about making comics that had no point, right? Because I wanted my hope was that somebody out there at some point would say like, why, what was it about like walking around the block that was so important or crucial to this guy that he felt the need to document it and share it with other people. And, you know, this was something I realized very early on was that what I, I'm hoping to do is I'm hoping to create that question in the reader's mind. So, the, and, and if they have that question, then they have, they have the possibility of trying to figure it out. <laughs> and there is a reason why I drew that comic. And if you can figure that out, perhaps you would also have a taste of this kind of weird mystery if you took the time to look at these mo those kind of moments in your own life you you would you would see something you didn't expect is it important that you as the as the artist as the writer knows why you chose to write about that is it important or do, do you feel that it, that you need to know that the answer to that question before you're going to put it down on paper, that the question of why this is worth writing about? No, I don't think so. Because, and I certainly am not trying to imply that I have any kind of answer. You know, the mysterious thing about the mystery is that the more it unravels, the wider it gets, right? And when I started making comics like this, it was just based off this weird feeling I had, you know, it was a weird feeling I had since I was a kid and trying to put that down on paper somehow, this intangible feeling. And so for sure, like the early part of my comics and my art and my writing and all that stuff was just 
was just exploring that feeling. You know, like, what is this thing that like is so compelling to me and that I can't, can't even begin to express. It's like a tip of the tongue kind of feeling like I, I, I want to be able to tell you what this is, but I don't know what it is. I got to I want to figure this out. It was like I say it's been the it's been the driving force in my life. I had never you know read a book on zen <laughs> at the, at that point or whatever, but it didn't stop me from from trying to use art to work it out or to explore it and to share it. And, you know that, that's what what I when I talk about zen the 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 metaphor I use is like, I feel like I was like stumbling through this briar patch and I, I knew I was going somewhere. I didn't know where, and I was tripping over myself and falling everywhere. And ev eventually I like stepped out onto this path and the, stepping out on the path was when I discovered Zen. Or, I mean, without even putting it just in terms of Zen, when I discovered the idea that there were people who had devoted their lives to exploring this mystery, whether they're Christian mystics or Hindu ascetics or Buddhists or Taoists or Jews or Muslims or whatever, that there was a, there was a, a path that people had found and they had kind of created this path based on whatever their particular cultural references were. But there was a path that was there. And once I found that path, it was like, okay, well, I'm still don't know where I'm going, but at least I've got some camaraderie <laughs> or somebody's kind of stomped out a little bit of a way for me to, to tag along on. Do you feel like the process is still trying to find an answer? Be, you know, because I, I, I guess it's sort of the sense I get and what reading I've done on it is that it sounds like part of the process is kind of is being okay with not having the answers. Yeah. And I mean, that's something that's, uh, you know, without getting too dorky about it, that's something that's, you know, Zen has this, people have this idea of it. It's, it's like, you know, what is the sound of one hand clapping or these cliches that people have about Zen? Uh, I mean, it, it's, it's important. And that's something that Zen emphasizes is that meaning and meaninglessness exist hand in hand. You know, and so that's one reason that Zen can seem so confounding is because it is, it's contradictory because life is inherently contradictory. It's helpful to come to terms. One side of something doesn't negate the other side of it, even though they're opposites. Um, Zen is just a way of engaging with the world the same way punk is, you know? It's, it's a path that people created that helped people in the past make sense of their lives. And there's all kinds of ways of doing it. You know, for me, I almost I almost felt bad when I first started to get interested in Eastern religions. I actually sat with a Hindu group, sat meditation with a Hindu group for a long time. And um, when I realized that actually I was probably a Zen Buddhist, I almost felt a little bit like a dork, right? Because it's like, seemed really obvious <laughs> or something, you know? If you're looking for enlightenment, that's like the first stop you should take, right? <laughs> sure, or yeah, you know, um, and in America there's, you know, you know, to bring it back to comics, Kevin Heisinger wrote that story about him, you know, him working in the catalog showroom or whatever. And they're like using Zen as like a promotional room or whatever. And it just, you know, it, I mean, frankly, you know, it's, it's been, it's uh, it, good old America has already figured out ways to commodify Zen Buddhism. So, you know, um, but it's just, it's the one that stuck for me in a lot of ways. It's just the one that it just, it was the one that when I dug into it, I just realized this is what, this is the way I've been all along. You know, this is, 
And so for somebody else, it'll, that'll be different. I, I, I would never claim to say that there's some kind of special, something special about Zen. 